Should you buy a Nintendo DS in 2018? Nintendo's original non-Game & Watch dual screen handheld was released back in 2004 and went on to sell over 150 million systems worldwide. With an almost endless amount of games, a control scheme that seemed revolutionary at the time of its release, it's easy to see why I absolutely adored the system when it was released back in the day. But the real question is, should you still buy Nintendo DS? Did the release of its successor, the Nintendo 3DS, make it mostly obsolete? Find out today as we go over the hardware the games, and compare the DS to the 3DS to find out which is ultimately better in today's video. Which by the way is sponsored by Viceroy Kicks, the achievement brand for gamers. This Kickstarter offers a wonderful new line of shoes for gamers along with the ability to earn real life video game achievements. Link to the Kickstarter in the description below and stay tuned to the end of the video to learn more about them. But for now, let's get right in to the video itself. Welcome to Stuff We Play, Home of Everything Weird and Retro, and if that sounds cool to you, why not subscribe? Today we're talking about anything and everything related to the Nintendo DS. The DS originally began development in 2002, and was initially not meant as a successor to the Game Boy Advance, but rather as a companion console. This was due to the console's dual screen design, and its inclusion of a touchscreen. While these may not seem like very special features nowadays, these were quite revolutionary by the standards of the time. This could also explain why, in 2005, an entire year after the DS was released, Nintendo released the Game Boy Micro, which was an extremely compact version of the Game Boy Advance. As time went on during development, the DS got more and more powerful, ultimately ending up with power somewhere between a Nintendo 64 and a GameCube, and thus Nintendo repositioned it as a proper Game Boy Advance successor. But whether we be talking about DS's, Game Boy Advance's, GameCube's, or N64's, these are all older consoles by the standards of today. And is the Nintendo DS outdated and obsolete, or is it still worth owning? Well that's what we're going to jump right into. The Nintendo DS was originally known during development as Iris, and later as Nitro. The name itself, DS, was originally meant as just a code name, as it was originally intended to mean developer system. However, Nintendo probably realized that DS could also stand for dual screen, and with that struck unintentional marketing gold. The first model of Nintendo DS was produced by Nintendo from 2004 to 2007, and after the release of the DS Lite was dubbed by many fans, the DS Fat. At launch, the DS sold for $150, so this was later dropped to $130 to coincide with the release of Nintendogs. The DS Fat came standard with two 3-inch screens, the bottom of which was the touchscreen, and a back lot that could be toggled on and off much like with the Game Boy Advance SP, and it had an average of 8 hours of battery life. It also had some nifty built-in functions, such as a calendar, the PictoChat chat room system, which trust me was the coolest damn thing if you had a friend group who took these to school back in the day, and the DS download play function, which will allow you to download demos of games and mini games from certain hotspots, and even later from a Nintendo Wii console. DS download play also let you play certain multiplayer modes in games such as Mario Kart DS without actually having to own the game itself. The DS also had built-in Wi-Fi capabilities, which, again, not impressive by today's standards, but still really damn cool by the standards of 2004. In theory, anyways. Unlike the comparatively streamlined system for adding friends for other consoles of the era, such as on the Xbox 360, the DS relied on these long-ass friend codes, and despite absolutely nobody I know thinking they were a good idea in any way, shape, or form, Nintendo is stuck by friend codes, even to this day, with the Nintendo Switch and even their various mobile apps. Friend code issues aside, it was cool to finally be able to have online Pokemon battles or to even visit my friend's villages in Animal Crossing Wild World. It is then also unfortunate that the Nintendo DS's online servers have been shut off for quite a few years at this point. One area Nintendo absolutely nailed though were the areas of backwards compatibility and region locking. The Nintendo DS has this nifty Game Boy Advance cartridge port for, you guessed it, playing Game Boy Advance games. Oddly enough, 
and cannot play Game Boy or Game Boy Color games, despite the Game Boy Advance being able to do that. But I'm wondering if for reasons of size, cost effectiveness, or both, if Nintendo instead used hardware similar to that of the Game Boy Micro, which also could not play Game Boy or Game Boy Color games. Regardless, any and all standard Game Boy Advance games work here without issue. Even games with weird stuff built into the cartridge work here, such as Yoshi's Topsy Turvy. And as for region locking, there is none, so play all the Japanese imports you want. Coming back around to the DS Fat itself though, this is certainly the ugliest of the DS models. Also, and this may just be an issue of my own personal DS Fat, but I noticed that the touch screens seem to be a little less responsive than those of later DS models. Though the technology used in DS touchscreens are, well, pretty old at this point, I find them to on the whole work pretty well. Interestingly enough with the DS Fat, it's apparently the most fragile of all the DS models. I've had mine for a few years now and it's well taken care of, but I've heard of many horror stories of the hinges cracking on these models over time. I say apparently, as the only DS model I ever had break was a DS Lite that a two year old got a hold of, may that system rest in peace. Nintendo clearly knew that DS systems were mostly going to be bought by kids or people who were on the move a lot, and as such, Reports of hinge issue aside, these seem seem to be built like tanks. Makes me wonder, have you ever had any reliability issues with the Nintendo DS? Please let me know in the comment section below. In 2006, about a year and a half after their original DS was launched, Nintendo continued with the long running tradition of releasing regular redesigns of their portable consoles, and thus we got the DS Lite, a sleeker, slimmer, more ergonomic version of the DS which originally retailed for $130 USD. When I say slimmer and sleeker, I mean in the best way possible. The DS Lite is probably one of the best looking handhelds I've ever seen. Though you can get an absolutely massive amount of colors and designs, it still manages to be simple yet appealing. Its screens are a little bit bigger than those on the original DS, yet they're also quite a bit brighter. The light in the name is twofold, since along with having brighter screens, it also weighs a bit less than the fat model. Battery life has also been increased, now we're averaging at about 12 hours on the charge. Thankfully, it also retains the Game Boy Advance backwards compatibility, making this perhaps the best way to play Game Boy Advance games. Perhaps the biggest nod in the DS Lite's favor is how damn common they are nowadays. While none of the DS models are what I'd call rare or expensive, the Lite is by far the most prevalent model out there. The third model of the DS was known as the DSi and was released in 2009 for 170 US dollars. I'm guessing the I stood for interactive since this model featured a plethora of new features, likely to be some sort of counter to the then popular original iPhone models. Some things that hinted this to me is that the Game Boy Advance cartridge slot was removed and instead the RAM was greatly increased and an online marketplace was added. On this virtual marketplace you could download titles known as DSiWare. Think of them like WiiWare, except unlike the WiiWare titles for the Wii Shop channel, there are not releases of classic Nintendo titles under Nintendo's Virtual Console service. DSiWare was all that was available here, though there were some standout games that were released in this fashion, and I'll get into them in the next section. This app store was an addition to expanded internet features, allowing some games such as Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 to work better with more types of Wi-Fi connections. The DSi also originally came preloaded with a sound recording manipulation app, a pretty terrible version of the Opera web browser, this pretty awesome Flipnote Studio app that I sunk way too much time into, and the ability to use both a front-facing and back-facing camera. The DSi's cameras were pretty meh at best, rivaling those of an old-school flip phone. The final model of the DS to be released was a DSi XL, known as the DSi LL in Japan, and this came out in 2010 in North America. Originally, this sold for $190, so I seem to remember this price being dropped fairly quickly. Everything you need to know about this system is in its name. It's a pretty huge DSi. The screens are an entire inch bigger, which, though that doesn't sound like much, when you realize we're talking handheld game consoles, that extra inch makes a world of difference. This contains all the interface changes, removals, and additions of the DSi, with nothing else really added. The only other change with the DSi XL was it originally came with this giant pen stylus, which I've never been able to find admittedly, but it looks absolutely awesome. If you want a DS for no other reason than to play DS games, this is by far the best option if you don't want to delve into 3DS territory. The last thing I'm going to note with the DSi is that there were a few games released physically that would only work on DSi models. And by a few, I mean six. 
These all take advantage of the additional features of the DSi and wouldn't even be bootable on a regular or light model DS. In a way, they remind me of the new 3DS exclusive titles, but that's a tangent I went on my 3DS buying guide. With the shutdown of the DS's online service, I think the DS Lite still beats out both of the later DS models. Though I adore the extra screen real estate provided by the DSi XL, the lack of GBA slot means that not only is backwards compatibility gone, but so is the ability to use peripherals such as the DS Rumble Pack or play games such as the DS Guitar Hero games. As a collector though, I am glad that most of these systems are still cheap. And I say most because, well, this is the time when Nintendo really got into special edition consoles, and some of those are definitely worth a good chunk of change. Overall though, not only would I say that the DS Lite is probably the best of the DS models, but it's so common and cheap that this is probably the cheapest possible way to get into handheld Nintendo gaming. But of course, what's a console without its games? Well, that's what we're about to get into. The Nintendo DS had a ton of great games, but let me also get this out of the way, it also had a lot of crap. I'm just going to say this now, much like with the Wii, roughly half of the DS's library was shovelware turds that you'd only get for the birthday party of kids you hated. But for every imagined babies, there's also an Animal Crossing Wild World or a Sonic Colors DS. Before we dive into games, which instead of being like many reviews in my previous buying guides are going to be more of a rapid fire list of 20 or so great games for the DS, I'd like to mention that all DS games that don't require the GBA slot are compatible on the Nintendo 3D even ones that are from other regions. Along with this, some DS games got ports to the Wii U Virtual Console, though this list is paltry at best. I'd also like to mention right now that yes, I know what emulation is. At least 12 people have probably commented why get a DS when you can emulate it. And to be honest, if you're pushing that hard for emulation, then no buying guide of mine is likely going to change your mind. But anyways, the DS is still great fun to use portably and I still see people on the bus occasionally playing them. Being the absolutely incredible number of games for the DS, I can honestly say there's something for everyone here. And so let's go through and name some standout titles by genre. And to begin, let's talk about the game briefly that was the reason I originally wanted a Nintendo DS. Nintendogs. Seriously, Nintendogs was so cool when it first came out. Yeah, looking back, it's kind of a glorified tech demo, but there were different versions focusing on dash hounds, Dalmatians, Chihuahuas, and you could teach them tricks and take them for walks and groom them and make your neighbors wonder why you're shouting the word sit a hundred thousand times in a row just to get the damn DS microphone to register your voice commands. These games aren't super incredible and much of the fun that can be had here could be better had in either its 3DS sequel or, you know, by spending time with real dogs. Moving from a pet simulation to a life simulation, we have Animal Crossing Wild World. The first ever portable Animal Crossing game, and while it's rough in some areas and doesn't have nearly as much to do as a new leaf on the 3DS, it's a ton of fun to relax and build up your village and even interact with the villagers. But moving from here to RPGs, we have Pokemon. Though Pokemon Diamond and Pearl are the games that got me back into the series, admittedly they're second only to X and Y as the worst games in the series to me. Mainly, they're just so incredibly slow. Thankfully, the speed and pacing issues here were fixed in Pokemon Platinum version, which is pretty much Diamond and Pearl, but a lot better. Shortly after this, there are also two of the best games in the Pokemon series, Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which are fantastic remakes of Pokemon Gold and Silver versions. I'll keep this brief as I've done a 45 minute long retrospective on these Pokemon games before, but they're everything a good remake should be and more. Also of note here are Pokemon Black, White, Black 2, and White 2. I'll keep these short as well, as I've done a video on these talking about why these games, Black 2 and White 2 in particular, are the absolute best games in the Pokemon series. Essentially, it's a classic Pokemon adventure that, though more story-driven than previous games, has less railroading than the likes of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Continuing on with RPGs, we have some great Final Fantasy remakes, Etrian Odyssey, Azuna, Legend of the Unemployed Ninja, Spectrobes, Dragon Quest IX, Mario & Luigi, Bowser's Inside Story, the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games, especially Explorers of Sky. The DS was definitely an RPG powerhouse, though there were some stinkers in there, 
there, such as Legacy of Ease and Sonic Chronicles of Dark Brotherhood. And speaking of Sonic the Hedgehog, let's move into platformers. There are three great Sonic games here in the form of the Sonic Rush trilogy. While they aren't perfect, they're definitely the fastest feeling of the 2D Sonic games, with Sonic Colors DS perhaps being the best work that Dimps has ever done on the Sonic series. Continuing on the 2D platformer front but shifting to Nintendo, we have New Super Mario Brothers, a decently fun Mario game which, despite having new in the title, is now over a decade old. Yeah, they could have thought that through a bit better. There are also some Kirby games I could mention here as well, but instead I'm going to mention the Legendary Starfy. Technically this game is Legendary Starfy 5 since there are four other games in the series that were released exclusively in Japan for the Game Boy Advance, but this game is great and is the only one that came out stateside. It's dirt cheap and a charming little platformer that was more or less Kirby but underwater. Super Mario 64 DS, which was a portable remake of Mario 64 for the N64, was a launch title. On paper, this is the definitive version of the game, especially seeing as it has three new playable characters. However, I would advise playing this one on a 3DS and not a regular DS, as Mario 64 just feels all sorts of wrong being played with a D-pad. Of course, there are also some Zelda games on the DS, mainly Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, but these just didn't do it for me. I think the emphasis on touch controls killed them especially, and while I know these ones definitely have their fans, hence why I'm mentioning them here, personally speaking, I cannot honestly recommend either of them. If you can find a way to play it though, I'd recommend trying The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Anniversary Edition, which is an enhanced remake of Zelda Four Swords for the Game Boy Advance. This was available as a free DSiWare download back in 2012 or so, and thus the only way to play it now is to find a DSi that has it installed. Speaking of great DSiWare games, DSiWare introduced me to one of my favorite puzzle platforming series, Mario vs. Donkey Kong. Mainly the title Mario vs. Donkey Kong Minis March Again. These puzzle platformers involve you maneuvering these mini toys through stages that are reminiscent of the classic Donkey Kong games. There's also a stage creation tool built into it, and I just go wild for those things. However, what's even better than this entry is the earlier Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2, which was actually given a standard physical DS release with much more content. I could go on listing great DS games for hours. The World Ends With You, Mario Kart DS, Rocket Slime, Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land, hell even Metroid Prime Pinball. Another thing you've likely noticed though is many of these games have gotten ports and updates to other systems such as the 3DS. And of course all of them work on the 3DS. So let's end off this guide by deciding if you're better off buying a Nintendo 3DS or a standard Nintendo DS. <laughs> In 2011, seven years after it originally launched, the Nintendo DS finally received its successor, the Nintendo 3DS. This handheld was around on par with the Wii in terms of power, and was backwards compatible with roughly 98% of all DS titles. It also had the ability to play games in stereoscopic 3D, and is still available for sale new nowadays as Nintendo's budget console offering. I've already covered the 3DS and its own successor, the Nintendo Switch, in their own respective buying guides. So I'm going to try to keep this short. The 3DS is perhaps even easier to get a hold of nowadays than the DS due to being available on the market new still. Meanwhile, Nintendo DS console production ceased a couple of years after the 3DS hit the market. Obviously if you want the latest and greatest in portable Nintendo gaming, go for the Switch. But if you want to experience DS games, I'd say either go for a new 3DS XL or a Nintendo 2DS, depending on whether you want the most powerful DS capable system out there that can play 3DS games as well, or the cheapest one. However, if you are on a super tight budget but still want to play DS games, perhaps go for the Nintendo DS Lite. This is a fantastic option that is usually dirt cheap and easy to find, and these seems seem to be built to last and come with that nifty GBA backwards compatibility. But what if you want the absolute best portable setup for Nintendo gaming? Once again, pass the DS all together and get a new 3DS or 2DS XL along with a Game Boy Advance SP, particularly the AGS 101 model. The AGS 101 model of the Game Boy Advance SP in particular because it has a brighter screen than the original Game Boy Advance SP, with this one being a bit more on par with the DS Lite. It's a Game Boy Advance, so you'll be able to play Game Boy Advance games, but also original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, 
But as for regular DS games, once again, the new 3DS or 2DS XL is the best. Though you won't be able to use accessories such as the Rumble Pack, you will be able to experience both DS and 3DS titles in the best manner possible. And even all the games that were physically released for the DSi and as new 3DS exclusive. You can even use the 3DS Circle Pad for movement in DS games, being the aforementioned Super Mario 64 DS much more enjoyable. So should you buy a Nintendo DS in 2018 and what's the best handheld Nintendo gaming setup in general? To be honest, if you want the absolute best setup possible, skip the DS altogether and get an AGS 101 Game Boy Advance SP and a new 2DS or new 3DS XL. But let me stop now before I ramble on just a bit. If you're on the fence about purchasing other game consoles, why not check out one of my other buying guides, such as this one I did recently on the PlayStation 3. And also, I would once again like to thank Bystory Kicks for sponsoring this video. This is an awesome new Kickstarter for this achievement brand for gamers. Gaming is something that recently has earned a reputation as something that has nothing but a negative influence. But of course, the opposite is true. This is what Viceroy Kicks believes, and as such, they are offering real life gaming achievements. The top tier of their shoes are competitive tier, which require, for example, to be ranked in the top 15% of a competitive online game to even get them. I think you should all follow the link in the description and check them out on Kickstarter. But anyways, let me know what your favorite Nintendo DS games are down in the comment section below. And while you're at it, why don't you subscribe to Stuff We Play for more great content like this. Or even back us on Patreon, because every dollar earned from Patreon goes back into the channel itself. So with that, thank you once again very much for watching. Stay classy, and I'll see you next time.